And Nick, I promise I'm going to put my badge on right after this. I actually took it off right before he said to wear it. So I didn't want to mess up uh, the mic cord and my hair. All right. And then I just have to press this, I think. Um, yes. All right. As Nick said, I am an entrepreneur, I'm a researcher, I'm an experience designer. And I was thinking if I could only choose one, I would say at the heart, I'm a researcher. And I say that because for as long as I can remember, I have been watching and listening and asking questions. And I've always just been a really curious person trying to understand the people and the world around me and connecting the dots and just trying to make sense of it all. And I don't know how many researchers we have here, but I feel like it's a bit of a blessing and a curse because sometimes I just feel like I cannot turn that researcher brain off. Can anyone else relate to that? Any researchers here? <laughs> yeah. And so I want to take us today on a bit of a research journey and explore ideas around automation and work and our happiness, and most importantly, our responsibility as the people making products and shaping products that so many people are using every single day. And we ourselves, of course, use them every day. And I was thinking kind of about work and how the pandemic has really impacted things. And we're seeing such an impact in so many uh, different labor sectors. Just on my way here, I noticed in one of the shops at the airport where you buy snacks and books and things, uh, where there would normally be people, there was not people, there was a kiosk and it said self-checkout. And I was in a rush, I couldn't go check it out, but I think probably it's because they were the labor shortage and they can't find people to work in a lot of roles in restaurants and shops and things because so many people have gone and retrained and now I think we're gonna see automation really come to a bit more of the forefront in terms of helping us with this labor shortage as a result of the pandemic in some industries. So to start us on this research journey, I want to ask you a quick favor and only if you're comfortable, but let's everyone close your eyes. I invite you to close your eyes really quickly. And now, wait for it, open your eyes and imagine that it is your lucky day and you've just won the lottery. You've won hundreds of millions. And this has never happened to me, but I imagine the first question that someone asks you, your colleagues, your friends, etc., is, are you going to quit your day job? So show of hands, or I don't know if you can do this in Slido, but show of hands, if you won the lottery, would you quit your day job? And don't worry if your boss is here, it's okay. <laughs> All right, so, okay. So um, Career Builder did a study a couple of years ago and they asked this question and it was pretty even. 49% of people said they would leave their job and 51% said they would keep their job. So the researcher in me was thinking, well, why would this happen? And this was from people of all different industries and types of jobs and sizes of companies and things. And so why would 51% of people keep their jobs? So thank goodness the survey went on to answer these questions. So who can relate to the idea that you would stay at your job if you would be bored if you didn't work? Okay, how about um, that your work gives you a sense of accomplishment and purpose? Or maybe that you want that financial security in case something happens to your hundreds of millions of winnings and I don't know, your friends take all your money. Um, how about that you would miss your coworkers perhaps? Okay, I definitely would. <laughs> the truth comes out. <laughs> all right, so kind of the takeaway for me was that work is really one of the many sources of fulfillment in our lives. Of course, it's just one of the sources because we as people, we crave connection, we crave challenge, we crave accomplishment, and work is really one of those things that can provide that for us. But a couple of years ago, I was just scrolling through social media and I noticed this hashtag called Smunday. And I thought, what is this all about? So after some little research on social media, I realized that Smunday is this hashtag people use on Sunday when that 
anxiety and nervousness of realizing, oh my goodness, tomorrow is Monday, I have to get back to my real life and maybe my coworkers I don't like and everything. And so they use this hashtag called Smunday. And it kind of struck me because it's a little bit opposite of what we just saw from that study. And that brings us to the idea of something called the paradox of work. And a Hungarian-American psychologist named Mihai Csikszentmihalyi I was really involved in this and also had a lot to do with the concept of flow. And in the 80s, he was at the University of Chicago and he and his colleagues did a study and they wanted to look into how people spend their time at work and also when they're not working and what their experience or quality of life is. So it was the 80s, so we didn't have iPhones and things like that to help us with these studies. So what they did was they developed their own research method, and it was called the experience sampling method, or you may have heard of things like diary studies. It's the same concept. So they recruited 400 people around Chicago from different industries, sizes of companies, et cetera. And then they wanted to kind of get a snapshot of what their life was like over the course of seven days. And to do this, they gave everyone a pager. So uh, remember pagers if you're old enough? <laughs> so everyone had a pager. And that pager was programmed to go off seven times a day. And then every time it went off, the people had to ask or answer certain questions about what they were doing, what they were feeling, what challenges they were maybe facing. Where were they? Were they at work? Were they at home? Were they working out? Who knows what? But this questionnaire gave them kind of a snapshot of what these people were doing every day at different points throughout their day, where they were at work, etc. And so the big question is, what did we find out? Based on this experience study, what was kind of that snapshot? And the survey concluded that people were happier and felt more fulfilled at work during their leisure hours. And that's where we really get to this idea of the paradox of work. And to dive into some of what the survey went on to talk about, and this is completely paraphrased, but just to make the point, the difference between what people said and what they felt. So concerning their time at leisure, people said things like, I'm dreading going back to work, I wish I could just stay on vacation forever, right? All of those thoughts that maybe you've experienced. And then when it came to what they said about work, Everyone seemed to be counting the days and hours and minutes until they could get out of there, right? You probably had those days, I know I do as well. Um, I can't wait for my next vacation. So this is what everyone said. But remember, that experience study was not just asking people, what are you doing, where are you? It was asking them how they were feeling as well. And so looking at what people said concerning how they felt, they said they felt things like they were tired or felt maybe anxious or not sure what to do them with themselves in their leisure time. And at work, they said they felt very um, accomplished, they felt focused, they felt energized, they felt um, challenged. And that's the disparity between what people said, right, and what people felt. It just didn't really match up. And that's really that paradox of work that we just talked about. And so one thing to keep in mind is that it's not really the job that necessarily makes us happy. It's the fact that our jobs or work gives us things that often we're not that great at doing for ourselves. And what I mean is that work really imposes things like structure and goals and consequences, right? If you don't do certain things in your job, maybe you won't have the job. So it also creates challenges for us. And if we're honest with ourselves, I think that not everyone is great at imposing these same things on ourselves in our free time and in our hobbies. It takes a lot of personal um, will to commit to a goal and then actually take the steps to make that goal happen, whether it's run a 10K or something like that. And so the point is that our jobs create an environment for 
flow. And by flow, I mean that moment when you are enthralled in a task and you are working on something and time kind of just pauses. For me, I feel like I know when I'm in a state of flow because if I'm working on something and I have music in the background, there will be that moment when I realize I have no idea what the last three songs are or that there was even music playing to begin with. I'm sure maybe you have some analogy like that, right? Where maybe it's music or maybe it's something else, but you just tune everything out and you're so focused on that one thing. So the researcher me got really curious and I wanted to understand what is happening in our brain when we are in this state of flow. And this is where I need to introduce you to someone named Charles Lim. He is a surgeon and a musician, and he also is really involved in studying creativity and the brain. And he's at the University of California um, in San Francisco. He's still practicing. And I don't personally know him, but I know him because he did a TED Talk. So he did a great TED Talk, which I really recommend you check out. It's called Your Brain on Improv. Um, and what he wanted to understand is what happens to our brain when we are in the creative mode and improvising. So he and his colleagues designed a study and they thought we're going to study jazz musicians as they are playing a keyboard. But to do this, they had to design a little miniature keyboard like that. Um, and it also had to make sure it's magnetically safe because they put the musicians inside an fMRI machine. And so you'll have to watch the TED Talk. I was nervous about the audio component of this, but it's really incredible. So they found some jazz musicians who agreed to like go in this fMRI machine and kind of have this keyboard resting on their legs. And then they had to lay really still and somehow still play like that. And then they monitored what was going on. And what they did was the jazz musician, musicians were asked to first play music that they memorized, so maybe Beethoven or Bach or something like that. And then they were asked to just riff and play and kind of go back and forth with Dr. Lim, who was in another room on another keyboard, and they were like jamming in this awkward way because this guy was in the machine. <laughs> and what they found was that something in the brain of that musician in the fMRI machine was changing and it was happening at the front of the brain. Now, to understand this a little bit more, and this is not atomically correct, but just for demonstration purposes here. So at the front of the brain, there were these two areas that were having activity. The front of the brain, um, first of all, had this self-monitoring component. And that's where you have things like that voice of doubt, or those inner critic thoughts or negativity, probably where imposter thoughts come from and things like that. And then the other part of the brain that they saw activity was the area of self-expression, not really shocking because the musician was playing, so they're improvising, there's creativity, individuality, et cetera. And what they found was when the musician was improvising, that part of the brain that was responsible for self-monitoring it had decreased activity. So it's as though when the musician was improvising, the volume was just turned all the way down on that negative voice, the inner critic, et cetera. And then they saw this increase in activity in that self-expression area responsible for improvisation, creativity, et cetera. And so in a flow state where the musician was improvising, we saw this self-monitoring get decreased and that self-expression get increased. And it's safe to say that in that flow state, our focus is just completely redirected to that one thing we are doing, in the case of that musician playing the piano, or for me when I forget the music is playing when I'm working on design or something. And it distracts us from that negative voice and that critic that we've probably experienced at some point in our lives. Now, I know that was probably a deep dive in neuroscience that maybe you were not expecting this morning, but I wanna quickly summarize. So from that, I think we can take away that we are very happy when we are in this state of flow because we don't have that negativity going on in our head. And then, Flow happens a lot when we are at work, which we just learned from that um, study of those people who um, were asked about the lottery. 
And so we can't discuss work and fulfillment without considering a really important question. And I'm asked this quite often, and it's the question of, do you think robots are going to take over our jobs? Or do you think the role of a product designer or UX designer is going to go away? And so thankfully, I found this website called Will Robots Take Our Jobs or TakeMyJob.com. And you can go to it. But I already went to it for us. So you can go and enter job titles. And so I entered in graphic designer. I entered in anthropologists, software developers. I thought that was to give us maybe a good cross section of everyone here. And it looks like graphic designers have about an 8% chance that maybe your job will be taken over by robots. And then anthropologists are really safe, only 0.8%. And software developers, 13%. So I think probably our field will be OK. But I also think that technology is really changing how we work and live so much. And even though our jobs may not have high risk of being impacted, our lives and so much of work is being infected, affected, right? We have more instantaneous, more connected lives than ever before. And this is where I have a little bit of concern around what's going to happen to our overall sense of happiness and fulfillment and, I would argue, potential as a society. And so there's two ideas that are really making our lives, I would argue, less human and more computed. And those ideas are around anticipatory design and automated design. And those are quite different. So to define anticipatory design, that's all about being able to try and predict people's needs or be a step ahead of them and be thinking or giving them what they need maybe before they're even thinking it. However, automated design takes it a little bit further in that it's not just being a step ahead of the person, it's actually taking the user a step ahead because you're literally making decisions on their behalf. So that's really the difference. And this idea of anticipatory design, I don't think it's necessarily anything really new, although it's trendy right now. But I think that at the heart of what we do as product designers, UX designers, et cetera, we've always been doing this, or else I hope we are, because Trying to anticipate people's needs involves research, it involves putting all the dots together and trying to give them what they need, make their lives or journey easier. And so this idea of anticipatory design, I don't think it's anything new because we see it in a lot of products and experiences that we all use quite often. So there's kind of three examples of how I think products we're using are employing this concept of anticipatory design already. So first is the idea of products that help us anticipate or anticipate our needs um, through discovery. So if you think of the last time you were on uh, an online shopping site or on a content site, maybe a news site or something like that, there is always that module at the bottom that says, you might like these or you should buy this. And it's trying to anticipate your needs and give you more of what it hopes you are interested in, right? So that's kind of one example in terms of trying to anticipate our needs with products that are helping us discover. The next category of product that I think is using anticipatory design is this idea of products that help us take action. So if you think of um, calendar, for example, whatever calendar you use, but if you have a meeting, um, let's say right after lunch, the calendar system would also try to anticipate your needs and recommend to you, hey, your meeting is at this time, you might wanna leave now or take this train or tram because of construction, this, that, and the other, right? So they're trying to anticipate our needs and help us take more effective action toward our goals. And the next example has to do with products that try and anticipate our needs by giving us tools to help us understand and 
Normally, I wear one of those Garmin watches to track my running and skiing and mountain biking and everything. And I love it because it takes so much information. And then instead of me needing to kind of monitor and um, understand all that information, do calculations and things, it just in the app just gives me insights and says, it literally says things like, you're overtraining or you're undertraining, you're maintaining. And it's so, so useful in terms of helping me understand. So I think that's a great example of products that are trying to anticipate our needs. And it does a really great job. But the thing is, I don't think anticipatory design is anything new, but it is evolving. And this leads me to an article I found a few years ago called The Next Big Thing in Design is Less Choice. And this was written by Aaron Shapiro, who at the time was the CEO of Huge. And in this article, he said that in the future, design will sweat the small stuff. And he went on to say that life is not made easier by anticipatory design because we're still forced to make a decision. And I can totally see his point. Products don't always make our lives easier because they can often lead to a lot of overwhelm. And I think a couple of great examples here. First of all, Amazon. We have probably been online shopping in whatever store you shop on a lot more in the past year and a half than maybe we previously did. And I think it's a great example of how it's trying to anticipate my needs, but I'm still left with quite an overwhelming decision. If I were just to buy laundry soap, if I were to go into the store and do this, it would probably take me just a few minutes. I'm just in and out. But as soon as I go onto Amazon, I have 397 options. And so they're trying to anticipate my needs by calling out things like bestseller or down below on that page. It shows me things I've previously purchased or highest rated. And so, yes, it's a trying to anticipate my needs, but at the end of the day, I still am forced to make a decision. And I think depending on your personality, you might be on this page for 10 minutes or something. The next example of products that try and anticipate our needs but still leave us with these decisions are streaming services, right? Um, I feel like I have this fantasy of how Netflix should work versus how it actually is because when I go to Netflix, I always just, I'm in this, I guess, escapist mentality where I'm just hoping that I'll go and I'll find the perfect film to watch and be completely lost for a few hours. And the reality is you come here and you are faced with these sea of little tiny thumbnails. And for me, it's instant overwhelm. And yes, they're trying to anticipate my needs by doing some curation, right? Top picks for Sarah. You might like this because you watched House of Cards, et cetera. But at the end of the day, to Aaron's point, the author of that article, I'm still forced to make a decision. And in some moment of frustration a couple of years ago, I tweeted, I go to Netflix, spend 25 minutes finding something to watch and give up. Who else can relate to this? Maybe last night. And someone immediately tweeted back and said, I joke with my boyfriend, that his favorite Netflix original is The Infinite Scroll. And I think it's just such a great summary of this problem. Because it's on one hand, it's great that we have all of these options, but it does lead us to this problem of decision fatigue, right? Whether you are buying soap or trying to watch, find something to watch or book a flight. So we, on average, are making 35,000 decisions per day. And what's interesting is, I think, the impact that mobile has on that. Because according to a study I found um, from the Global Web Index in 2019, we spend an average of three hours and 18 minutes of mobile screen time, which I would assume is up slightly because that was two years ago. Um, and we also spend two hours and 22 minutes on social and messaging daily, uh, again, from the same study. And when I saw these numbers, the researcher in me thought to myself, well, what happens if we extract this over a lifetime, right? So I did some rough math and I checked it about 10 times because I was <laughs> wanted to make sure I'm right. And I thought, 
If we average about an 80 year lifespan, and we take a few years off at the beginning when hopefully you don't have a phone when you're one or something, um, it works out to eight years of mobile screen time. And to me, that was shocking to think that we're spending eight years of just that mobile screen time. And I think it kind of was this pause moment for me in thinking about our responsibility as people designing a lot of these products and what can we do to maybe reduce this amount of time or improve the quality of this time, right? So people just aren't spending 25 minutes on the infinite scroll of Netflix uh, for eight years of their life. And ultimately, what can really save us from this decision fatigue that we experience and is probably going to keep increasing the more that we're on these devices? And so we have to go back to the article, because in the article, the author um, said that in the future, decisions are really going to be made and executed on behalf of the user. And that the goal is not to just help the user make a decision through anticipating their needs, but to literally create an ecosystem where a decision is never made because those decisions happen automatically and without user input. And that's really that big difference between anticipating people's needs and automating decisions and doing things for them automatically. So a couple of examples of how products are already automating decisions for us, and I think they're doing a great job of it. So you could think about um, smart home devices. So the Nest thermostat, for example. This is, I don't have one, I have something similar, but it's really convenient because your home is always at the perfect temperature and because I'm away right now, it's warmer, hopefully not killing my plants because it knows that I'm away. And it's all happening automatically and I don't need to be um, playing with the device or the app even, it's just happening all in the background. And it's good for my quality of life and it's good for my bank account too and it's good for the environment. Another example of where I think automated design um, was executed really well is in a product called Digit. And I think they closed down, but I discovered them about 10 years ago. And Digit is an app that helps you save money. So I have a friend who's a financial planner, and if you ask any financial planner, how can you save more money? They'll tell you, you need to make it automatic, right? The best way to do it is to set it up so you don't have to think about it. But setting that up is often challenging because banks sometimes don't have the best interfaces to do that. So Digit aimed to help solve that problem. And when you sign up for Digit, you would connect your bank account. And then what was really brilliant was Digit would determine, I believe it was every week, how much money it thought you should save based on your spending habits. So it might be 50 one week, 100 the next, 25 the next, it really just depends. But what was really, really fascinating was after using this for about a month, I was shocked at how much money there was in this little savings account it created. And it was because, first of all, it was happening automatically. And second, I was not needing to make the decision of how much to save. And I think that I would not have been as aggressive as maybe the app I probably just would have locked in at a flat amount every single week versus this app. It was fluctuating and it worked really, really well. And I think it's such a great example of automation working um, pretty flawlessly, to be honest. I wish it still existed. And so these examples, I think, work really well. But I think we also have to wonder what happens if these systems automate without the right information or without the right context. And so we're going to get a little bit meta here. So I want us to imagine that we are all working at a design agency together. And we have recently been working on um, a dashboard for a SaaS product um, for business owners who have a bunch of vehicles. So maybe electricians or plumbers or something like that. They have all these vehicles they need to manage. So We've just got to the point where the client is very happy with this dashboard uh, on the desktop version. 
And now they say, okay, let's go over to the mobile because obviously mobile is going to be important for people that have businesses that operate in different locations or on the go outside of the office. So imagine that the software that we're using has a button that we can press and it says like translate desktop wireframe to mobile. And wouldn't that be amazing? But the designer in me thinks that actually might be a disaster because not all of that information on that desktop wireframe is going to make sense for a mobile experience, right? You know, there's probably information and actions that don't, don't make sense for the person who might be using this on the go versus the manager sitting at a desk with a bigger screen, et cetera. And so we don't need to know the details of this, but for example, there's this kind of recent transaction section with multiple columns of detailed information about transactions and the person who made the transaction and the vehicle, et cetera. But if we had this button just turn into mobile, it would result in a really cluttered and I think not very useful interface. Same thing with the bottom of this wireframe where it's uh, giving us kind of a health update or health status of the vehicle fleet. And it might be determined that those, um, the vehicle performance in summary is just not useful on desktop or on mobile, or maybe it needs to be completely um, reconfigured to make sense for that mobile experience. And so, I think we need to ask ourselves what happens to automation if the AI system making those decisions doesn't have the right information or the right context, right? Sometimes I'm just not convinced that the system can make a decision. I think sometimes we as people have that knowledge that is necessary to have that context to make the right decisions. So I want to give us some cautions to think about as Perhaps we are faced with opportunities to think about automation in the products that we are using and what some of the consequences of that might be. So the first caution I have for us is around the idea of accuracy, because what happens when anticipation isn't accurate or when that automation fails? If the financial product saves the wrong amount of money or the thermostat puts my house at the wrong temperature, it's not the end of the world, right? It's probably not that big of a deal. But sometimes the consequences are a lot higher. So I think aviation is a really great example of that. So we know that autopilot has been happening in planes for a while, but what I honestly didn't know until I read a book called The Glass Cage by Nicholas Carr is that pilots are at the control uh, on average about three minutes, a little bit at the beginning of the flight and a little bit at landing. And I always try not to think about this when I'm flying somewhere, but it really is um, just fascinating to think that. And you have to think that skills are like muscles, right? If we're not using our muscles, we lose strength. If you don't use your skills, you lose them. And that is something called de-skilling. And the Federal Aviation Administration of the United States, they had a report and they said that pilot error was involved in two thirds of all of the crashes from 2000 to 2010 largely as a result of this phenomenon of de-skilling. And one example is in 2009, there was a flight going from Rio to Paris and it encountered really, really bad weather. And I don't know much about aviation, but I know enough to let you know that on the outside of the plane, there are these things called airspeed monitors, which are taking in all kinds of information that feeds into the autopilot system. But because they encountered this really bad weather, these airspeed monitors got covered up in ice and they could not work anymore. That caused the autopilot system to disengage. So then in the cockpit, the alarms are going off, it's like disaster time, and the pilots had to take over. And what the co-pilot did was he pulled the nose of the plane up really, really fast, which caused it to stall. And then 
I assume kind of like a roller coaster, it started descending at, I believe, 10,000 feet per minute, so really fast. And when the French investigated this tragedy, part of the report said the following. It said, the loss of coordination in managing the surprise of that autopilot disconnection led really quickly to the loss of cognitive control of that situation and the loss of physical control of the airplane. In other words, de-skilling and confirming what that study from the Federal Aviation Administration in the United States said as well. So it's a really extreme example, but I think it's important for us to consider if automation fails, can that user step in and course correct? Or if there's a really high consequence, such as this case, what can we be doing to try and help reduce the impact of de-skilling? And what might, we, what might we need to be doing to help the user maintain those skills that we are automating for them so that we don't end up with situations where there's tragedy because the consequences of automation were really, really high. The next caution I have for us is around the idea of um, innovation, really. And I start to question if we go down this path of lots and lots of automation, where will new ideas come from? And how are we going to see ways to improve? Because I think that when we are working on things, we're just, I think, naturally thinking, how do I do this faster? How do I do th this better? How might I save money doing this, right? Your brain, or at least my brain, is always thinking about optimizing, right? But I'm not sure where does that uh, happen if everything is being automated and who will be innovating? So one um, industry that I think is a really great example of this is automotive, right? Um, automotive, some com car companies um, started replacing people with robots, which you would think makes a lot of sense. And I read a really great article um, in Bloomberg that talked about this. And I think the example was from Toyota, who invested millions, probably billions, to convert their um, factory lines from people into largely robots. But after doing that for a while, they realized that maybe it was better to bring the people back. And the reason for it was partially because the people were able to do what I just said, spot opportunities for improvement, et cetera. But what they also realized was that um, if they had to change the production line, it could often take weeks to reprogram all of those robots and also reposition them all over the production line. However, and of course, depending on the um, size of the change to the production line or the complexity of it, people could often make these changes in just a weekend rather than weeks. So from that perspective, they kind of did a reverse and put a lot more people back in because they realized in going to a more automated system, they were losing that element of um, innovation. And I think um, opportunities for spotting improvements or maybe spotting problems as well. Um, so a takeaway that I had is that I think machines are great at doing things over and over and over with great precision and things like that. But people, because we have that problem solving mentality and things, we can do things over and better. So think about what happens to innovation if we are automating every single thing. And then the next kind of question or caution I have for us is what will become of the human experience if so many things in our lives, work and play, are automated? Because as we learned at the beginning um, from the uh, lottery study and we know that people find satisfaction in the struggle even though 
I know for me, sometimes there are things in my business that I just wish I could not do, but when I finish it, I feel so amazing, right? So we find this satisfaction in the struggles, even though at the time, maybe we don't see the um, excitement there and we seek to overcome these things. So what's going to happen if more and more is automated? And what's going to happen to our fulfillment? Especially, we know from that first study, the value that work brings to our lives because it gives us that structure, it gives us the opportunity for challenges and things like that. So another question I have for us is, what are we going to do with all the free time that maybe we will have? I think. It's almost a fantasy. We think it would be amazing, but at the end of the day, we know from that study previously that we were not as happy as we thought we would be um, at leisure time. And also, I would argue, are we going to trust ourselves to be responsible with all of this extra time we'll have as well? So what will more automation and anticipatory design do to our fulfillment? So as we move forward and you're probably going to be faced with decisions because maybe you think it's a cool opportunity to use automation and products you're working on or you have stakeholders who think it's the next best thing and they tell you you have to do these things i want to leave us with three principles um, to keep in mind as we are working on products um, and our responsibility uh, to make sure that maybe we are not creating more problems than we are solving. So the first principle or guideline I have for us is the idea of transparency. So as we saw in some of the examples, sometimes the consequences are low, sometimes the consequences are high. And I think that we need to keep in mind that line between suggesting something versus making a decision on people's behalf because with that um, financial example that was doing savings for me, I really liked how it provided so much transparency. So even though I gave it the permission to go into my bank account and save money, I could still go and see exactly how much money was saved each week, each transaction, when it was saved, and I could easily reverse course correct if I didn't like what it saved last week, or I could even do things like pause it because if I knew I had maybe a big expense coming up next month, maybe I'd want to skip three weeks. So that's what I mean by transparency and making sure that people can have that control to reverse things or step in and not um, have the automation maybe make decisions that don't have the proper context, such as I said, um, if I had a big expense coming up, how would it ever know that? It's only in my brain. Um, the next principle I have for us is the principle of curation. So on that anticipatory design side of things, we saw in e-commerce and um, streaming services that those recommended modules, right? And we see it everywhere. And I think that based on some usability testing I did a couple of years ago, I think people are really skeptical of algorithms because when people scroll to that section where it says, you might like this, you might like that, a lot of people in usability tests I did say, I'm not clicking that. They just put that there to try and get me to click so they can make more runny, right? So on one hand, I think we need to think if we're going to be curating, how can we make that curation feel more human so that people don't have this almost blindness with banner ads we have this term banner blindness because so many people just kind of tune them out and i wonder if we also have kind of recommendation um blindness so as an example how could we um mitigate this i think if you think of streaming services instead of just saying for example with netflix instead of just saying you might like the show um scandal because you watched house of cards that sounds a little robotic and it lacks context and people could be skeptical of that. So I think instead, what if we added context and said, you might like Scandal because you watched House of Cards and by the way, they're both political dramas, they both take place in Washington DC and this, that and the other commonalities between the two and I think that would be one way that we could help um, make that curation feel more human and less uh, 
like a computer just spit it out on the screen. Um, the third principle I have for us is the idea of trust, because obviously, if we are going to anticipate people's needs and make decisions on their behalf, privacy comes up and we can only make decisions if we have quality information about the situation. So I think we need to consider if we're really going to start making more decisions on people's behalf, how can we earn their trust more because they're pretty skeptical to begin with. And I always have this principle in mind of give and take. And I say this all the time when I'm um, working with clients and stakeholders and colleagues. But as an example, a couple of years ago, I was working on a um, healthcare product and it was this healthcare insurance type product. And the beginning of the experience required us to ask the user a lot of personal questions about their health so we could recommend different um, health plans for them because we have health insurance in the United States and it's this whole giant interesting process. But <laughs> part of the challenge with that was asking all of these personal questions. And so the principle of give and take was in this interface, we had all of these questions, but for every question we were asking, we were also on the screen explaining how we were going to use that information or literally showing them an example of why they should give us that information. So I think it's really important that we don't forget about the importance of that principle of trust because as I said, if we're going to anticipate people's needs and make decisions on their behalf, the quality of those decisions and the information we give them is so dependent on the quality of the information that we can get out of them. So transparency, curation, and trust, keep these in mind as you are faced to probably walk that line between just being a step ahead of someone and anticipating their needs or taking them a step ahead without them doing anything because you automated that decision. And I think it's really important to consider, are we doing these things out of novelty or are we just doing this out of necessity? And to close, I want to share a really quick story. A couple of years ago, I was uh, landed in London. I was on my way to a conference and I got in the car and the driver said, oh, what do you do? And I just vaguely said, oh, I work in technology. And he went on this rant and he said, if I was the prime minister, I would shut down the use of technology. And the researcher in me was like, oh, say more. So he went on to say that the computer is a good invention, but it's not good for the public. And then he went on to tell me about how he has a couple of um, children and they're always on their phones and social media and he does not like this. It's just not good in his opinion. And then he said his daughter was a pilot. And then I thought, this is really creepy because I was going to give a talk similar to this. And he told me about his daughter training for a pilot and how much time she spends just in the simulator, learning about the automated systems and everything. And our discussion really ended on an interesting point. And the point that um, I had planned to make previously as well uh, at the talk in London. And he said to me, um, and I didn't tell him anything about the talk, but he said to me, you know, we or you have this responsibility to solve problems with technology but also really not to create bigger ones. And I think that's really important to keep in mind as we walk that line between being a step ahead or literally, and sometimes maybe shoving people a step ahead without asking them. So thank you. And I look forward to talking with you. Oh, both. <laughs> okay. Hi. Our magic trick of how I turn into Nick. Do you have the, <laughs> you have the iPad? Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much, Sarah. That was that was great. Thank you. Um, this is kind of you're kind of a guinea pig because we're using. This is thing. it working? <laughs> that's, that's a good question. I'm seeing a bunch of questions. Um, am I supposed to be seeing all of these? I just asked the most popular one, right? Who's in charge of this? <laughs> okay. So, I feel like I'm on a first, game show. Yeah, this is, this is your quiz. Right, Are you ready? Q&A. It stands for quiz and attack. First quiz. Oh, 
Without looking at your slide deck, can you name the first six thumbnails on your Netflix stream? Oh, goodness. Just kidding. That's not the question. Oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> I was actually thinking, oh, what were they? Okay. <laughs> that's, that's, that's my joke. Okay. Okay, so this, this uh, comes from Felix in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Okay. First time caller, a long time listener. Uh, just, Are they really in Baton Rouge? No, I'm, I'm kidding. Oh. That, that, it just says Felix. I, mean, I, I don't know where he is. He's probably in this room. I know we're streaming this, but okay. <laughs> Felix is probably in this room right now. Uh, just got me thinking. If you have to spend lots of time in meetings during the day, you can never get in the flow. Does this make us less happy and fulfilled? Well, I'm not a trained psychologist, but I would probably say meetings are not the best for your happiness and state of flow because, maybe unless you're leading the meeting and then you really love it. But I think that concerning flow, the problem with meetings is that you're always interrupted. And I forget the number, but I've read something which said it takes you, I'm X amount of minutes to get back into the flow of what you're doing, right? Every time you check an email or respond to a mobile notification, I mean, you just have to get back into the zone and it, it's a waste of time. Yeah. yeah. I think the band camp guys talk about this in one of their books. And you made me think, um, there's a really great app. I have nothing to do with it, but it's called Flow. And it's kind of um, a Pomodoro timer type thing. But I love it because if you're one of those people who are tempted to check the email or do this and that and then break that flow, this has a timer for 25 minutes and I mean, it instantly improves my um, productivity. Yeah. This is just a follow up of my own. Um, when I saw the, the graph about the, or the graphic about the vacation. Uh huh. Um, that really bummed me out and it really hit home because I, I, I have that like I, yeah. I find it the first few days of vacation I'm just miserable. Uh huh. Um, do you have any like tips or tricks for how to sort of find flow in, in vacation? How to find flow in vacation? That's a great question because after this I am spending a few days in Italy and <laughs> Traditionally, I uh, like to do my email and have these work projects, and I kind of promised a few entrepreneur friends of mine, like, I'm not going to work when I'm in Italy. So maybe we'll have to have a follow-up tweet after this or something, but uh, you kind of need to have a plan. So I purchased literal, actual books, not on the screen, so I'm not tempted to uh, go check my email. Um, so I think it's all about having a plan, right? Because I think if you just are given a blank slate of time, you don't know what to do, and then you default to the things that are comfortable, email, Twitter, or whatever you, you do. So for me, hopefully, I will be reading books, trail running, and um, trying to get lo not lost in Italy. Yeah, that, that resonates <laughs> pretty well. Follow me on Instagram to find out how that goes. <laughs> cool, will do. Um, next question is, uh, do you have any concerns about privacy regarding the smart tech, like the Nest and stuff like that? Yeah, I mean, I only have the Nest because it came with my apartment, but I don't have the Facebook portal, the Google Nest, or is it Nest? I don't know what it's called. There's so many of them. Um, yeah, I have a lot of concerns with privacy, and I think it highlights that kind of last principle we ended on, right, with the give and take principle and thinking about how can we be building that trust so we can be making hopefully better decisions and recommendations for people. But um, yeah, personally, I am not one of those need to have every gadget. I mean, my Garmin watch is enough. <laughs> I don't even have an Apple watch. Um, the next question I have here is from Reto in San Bernardino, California. Uh, how I don't know if you're telling the truth or not, but okay. No, I just, <laughs> okay. Uh, I, just, I just love the way that sounds. <laughs> it's um, fun. <laughs> how can we gain the user's trust in these automatic decision algorithms? How do we prove to them that these algorithms are not designed with malicious intent? Yeah, so, well, I think it follows up nicely with that idea of give and take, but I think, too, if we have made decisions on people's behalf, I think, we need to be really transparent about that. And then depending on the severity of that decision, maybe explain or give an option to let them see like why that decision was made or how it's made, allow the user to dig deeper. Some people won't care, right? But I think for those that do, we need to make sure there's an easy way for almost, almost for them to see like a, a breadcrumb of what just happened and 
allow them to maybe reverse course as well or make adjustments um, because maybe there was context that was, like I said with that example with the savings, that was in the person's head, but the system had no idea. Yeah, that's, that's a good answer. Um, I guess we have time for maybe one or two more. Uh, and, and I think that question that I just asked was actually posed before you kind of answered it in your That's slide the thing deck, with these like the things, yeah. Yep. yeah. Um, this is from Leon. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> is it really from From you? Buenos Aires. Oh. <laughs> um, not a question, just no, nothing Netflix now has a play something at random feature. It's completely I saw that. my life replacing scrolling time with skipping time. <laughs> So I saw that, and I have not used it yet, but now I'm curious because it sounds like it worked really well for you. Uh, well, it, it does play something at random based on what you've already watched. So it's actually quite useful, but I feel like it's the same problem. You're like, ah, I can't skip. Something better will come up. Was it something you had previously seen a thumbnail for and you had just never clicked into, or was it just something completely brand new? Um, that I was, watched before, and then there was something that I never watched, but I get recommended all the time. Ah. Morty, by the way. <laughs> so it was pretty good. It was a pretty good. <laughs> all right. Well, I will try it out. Thank you. Okay. Let's let's have one last question. Okay. Uh, again, from Felix, um, Baton Rouge. I think he's he was. From. <laughs> uh, algorithms versus curation. What could or should social media companies do to overcome confirmation bias and feedback loops? Wow, that's a big question. <laughs> I think, I mean, I think they're starting to do some of this in terms of transparency around whether posts are um, deemed potentially false information or not. Um, I think getting out of um, what's called the filter bubble, and I'm forgetting the guy's name who did this. He might have written a Times article or a TED Talk or something. Anyway, Google filter bubble. But he has a lot of great things to say about this, but I think it's a challenge because everyone's in these echo chambers and, and to the point of the algorithm, they want you to stay on the product, so they just give you more of what you like. So, but Google the filter bubble, it's really great. I'm sorry for the guy, I forget his name. <laughs> cool, thank you so much, Sarah. Let's, uh, let's have another round of applause for Sarah Judy. Thank you very much. All right.